thank you very much indeed for inviting me, um, indeed Beverly and um, uh, all of your team. So um, I'm going to uh, be talking about management issues, difficult management issues in association with, uh, um, with uh, uh, cancer-associated thrombosis. So um, I'm going to give a quick overview of the statistics and etiology, and then we're going to move into exactly when we should be, and exactly what we should be um, uh, investigating when people, uh, you're right, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, to detect cancer when there's an unprovoked uh, VTE event. We're going to look at thrombocytopenia in cancer patients, recurrent VTE in, in cancer patients, uh, and bleeding in cancer patients, all of whom have had thrombotic uh, events. So um, a cancer-associated VTE uh, accounts for about 20% of all thromboses worldwide, uh, is a risk for VTE patients, or its risk for cancer patients is about four to seven times higher than uh, baseline. I think we've already sort of heard those figures earlier on today. The risk for VTE for recurrent VTE is about three times higher in cancer patients compared to those without cancer. Uh, and survival of cancer patients with VTE, as we've already heard, is lower than that of patients without VTE. It's not quite sure as to what a, uh, um, uh, is actually causing that. And this is just, a, 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 I, th I thought, an interesting schemata that just uh, looked at some of the, the causes of uh, a cancer. Uh, uh, we know that a carcinoma mucins can, can cause it. We know that there is an increase in cytokines, uh, an increase in COX-2, that's the in, in inflammatory uh, induction, and, of course, also... Um, also, uh, uh, increase in tissue factor in particular, uh, uh, and tissue factor is released uh, when the uh, uh, vascular endothelium uh, is breached. So there are lots of uh, uh, things involved. So there are, as well as that, of course, there are lots and lots of patient-related factors that significantly increase the risk for cancer. And, and that's an obvious but important statement to make. So VT is the second most cause for death after the malignancy itself in cancer patients. Uh, it's the high, and the highest risk sites, as you've already been uh, informed today, uh, are those uh, in, in particular of the pancreas and the stomach, so the, the upper GI, but also the lung, the brain, the ovary and the kidney, and hematologically, uh, uh, lymphoma and particularly myeloma. And VTE and cancer when they're occurring together, leads to an increased risk for hospitalization, an increased risk for bleeding, both and also recurrent VTE on anticoagulants. And we've all, I've already just, I've literally just said that, uh, but we've heard about that uh, throughout the day. Historically, unprovoked VTE is associated with occult cancer in about 10% of patients uh, within a year. And uh, the NICE Clinical Guideline 144 from 2012, so an, an now getting a little bit old and perhaps uh, it needs refreshing, I'm sure Beverly uh, agrees with that in, uh, uh, for certain things, uh, states that in patients uh, greater than 40 with a first unprovoked VTE, a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis and mammograms in, uh, in women over 40 is recommended. Uh, more, race, more recent data, however, and I'm going to, sh I'm going to show you that in a moment, uh, has placed that, uh, the incidence of occult cancer uh, at more like 4%. So this is the study uh, that, the, um, that actually informed the NICE guidance. Uh, there's another one as well, the Trousseau study, uh, but this was a randomized control study. It's a very small study with only uh, about 100 patients in each group. Okay. Um, uh, but what it showed was that cancer-related uh, mortality was, in fact, about 10%. Um, sorry, uh, 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 cancer-related, yeah, mortality was about uh, uh, 10%. Um, and, uh, uh, sorry, the cancer-related VTEs 
Uh, cats were uh, about 10%, so here 13 out of 29 and here 10 out of 102 in the non-screened group but by comparison with the screened group. So there isn't a, a, a difference in those two groups. Um, uh, but because uh, it, it is such a, a, a small number of patients, it's not powered to show a difference between the two groups. So even though it's a randomised controlled trial, um, and that, that's why it was chosen uh, by, the, uh, by NICE, uh, it's, it's not powered to show a difference. Um, this is the uh, so-called Trousseau study uh, by, by uh, Van Dormand. Oh, dear me. Um, and this shows uh, essentially a lot, a lot more patients, 630 uh, idiopathic thromboses, okay, um, uh, and the cancers are exactly the same, the curable cancers are exactly the same, all-cause mortality is exactly the same, uh, but uh, uh, what, what this did show was that actually um, in routine screening, uh, the cost was around about 165 euros, but the um, investigation of false positive findings significantly increased uh, the uh, expense of uh, uh, the extensive, in other words, CT scan, scanned patients. So, just to talk a little bit about CT scans, they convey a very high exposure to radiation equivalent, well, there's some very variable figures in the literature, somewhere between about 200 and 250, up to as, as much as 400, 450 chest X-rays, uh, or about 39 mammograms. Um, and as I've just said, there is a significant cost associated with false positive findings, so-called incidental omas, uh, re obviously requiring further investigations, as I've just said. And of course, there is a psychological and biological morbidity which may be associated with further investigations. And, so, and also, it's incorrect to assume that uh, necessarily that earlier detection results in improved clinical outcomes. I think we've uh, discussed that a bit this morning as well. However, um, what, we, uh, what has uh, happened, and literally in the last month, uh, by a carrier's group, actually the first author was Khan uh, in April this year, um, it, it, there's been a publication of... Uh, five, or actually four, reasonably well, uh, 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 reasonable quality evidence trials, two with uh, high quality evidence and two with moderate quality, against this meta-analysis, uh, analysis, uh, the data from which has been released, I don't exactly know how it's been released without it being published, but, um, uh, uh, and, and essentially what this has shown uh, um, is actually the instance of uh, VTE is significantly less than 10%, more like 4%, as I've mentioned. And this is just going uh, more deeply into the two higher quality trials, the uh, Carrier trial and, and the Robin trial, 845 patients here, um, limited screening only versus a combination of limited screening with a CT scan, no significant difference between the two for occult cancer, about 3% versus 4.5%, no clinical benefit uh, uh, and the mean time for cancer diagnosis or cancer-related mortality, sorry, in, in the meantime. And, 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 that, uh, and then the, the overall cancer diagnosis here is, is as I said, a, a, about 4%. And then the other high-quality trial was the ROBIN trial, 395 patients. Once again, limited screening only versus a combination of limited screening, this time with a PET-CT, uh, showing no significant difference between the two for occult cancer. Actually, that was 2% and 56 but... Uh, um, again, that showed no significant rates of cancer diagnosis. Uh, with, once again, an overall cancer diagnosed of a, 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 about 4%. So what should we be telling our patients, then, uh, who have had a, 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 prox a, a completely spontaneous, particularly proximal, uh, a VTE event over the age of 40? Well, Khan suggests that you need to let them know about NICE, consider, and I'm hopefully, uh, it, Simon's here, I'm, I'm talking to my patients a lot, Simon. S consider screening for cancer with CT. The most recent data suggests that one in 25 people, 
4%, uh, uh, with unprovoked VTE, may have an underlying cancer, that there's limited evidence to support the benefits of extensive screening, particularly involving harm from ionising radiation, uh, that all such patients should receive uh, routine cancer screening plus additional uh, investigations, depending on symptoms and signs and in particular blood investigations, uh, uh, and maybe some interventional investigations uh, as required and, and as uh, is found out from the uh, uh, history and um, uh, uh, investigation of the patient, uh, examination of the patient. Um, and then if, if patients opt out of CT scanning, maintain a low th threshold for suspicion uh, for a, a, a BT event. Sorry, oh, cancer in associating with the BT event. And then he's put forward, obviously, some suggested routine screening for unprovoked thrombosis, and this is not, not, uh, not surprising to you. So those of older age and those who are smokers maintain a, a, a particularly high uh, uh, attitude uh, in terms of uh, risk. Um, worrying symptoms would obviously be weight loss and GI bleeding and some constitutional symptoms. Uh, a physical examination needs to be guided by the clinical history, a chest x-ray, some basic blood tests, full blood count, calcium, LFTs, I would suggest we ought to be doing uh, renal function here as well, certainly renal analysis, and then as I've already, already mentioned, uh, laboratory screening tests as symptoms and history suggest. Um, I, and actually just before this was published, so actually last year, Karana, who you've already heard and who's very uh, active in publishing uh, in this area, uh, suggested that patients with an unprovoked VTE should undergo a thorough medical history and physical examination, sorry, um, uh, basic laboratory investigations, uh, such as a complete blood count's metabolic profile and a chest X-ray. Uh, and then he suggests that actually, uh, if not up-to-date, patients undergo age and gender-specific uh, cancer screening, um, depending on the site you might be thinking about. But not necessarily to have a, a, a broad CT scan of the abdomen uh, uh, um, uh, 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 and pelvis and chest. Um, I thought I'd, uh, I'd just bring this, this is David Keeling's group, who, who um, really his, um, this is just a, um, a cohort study which of, about a, of, of about 1,400 patients who, were, who have been referred to his thrombosis service, actually about uh, in 2013 to 2014, over 16 months. Uh, 239, uh, about 17% had confirmed thrombosis. DVTs, only DVTs at the moment. 21% already had a cancer diagnosis. 85% of the remainder had an unprovoked uh, VTE event. Uh, so uh, th that left uh, 62 actually who agreed to a CT scan. 28 of those scans demonstrated an abnormal, uh, an abnormality, but only one of which diagnosed a malignancy. And so because of that very, very low yield, he suggested that actually uh, his... Um, uh, uh, his department and certainly his trust uh, 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 rethink their policy uh, for coping with patients with um, uh, completely spontaneous, uh, unprovoked VTE events. So I'm going to move on now, um, and I'm going to move on to, uh, I think, thrombocytopenia in the first instance in association with... Um, uh, anticoagulating patients uh, with uh, um, uh, a cancer-associated thrombosis. And, and, and the reason why I put this up here, one has to make a, a judgment always between the risk for bleeding and the risk for thrombosis if one is considering using anticoagulants. And obviously, if so someone is thrombocytopenic, uh, then you need to be think thinking very carefully about the risk for bleeding. Fine. Uh, so, when present, uh, thrombocytopenia, uh, there needs to be a risk-benefit balance, as I mentioned, okay? So, in the first three months after VTE, the risk for recurrence is higher, um, as I mentioned, and every effort should be made to maintain safe administration of therapeutic anticoagulation. Okay, so that's three months after a thrombotic event. Uh, so, um, 
we then need to think about what happens after that. And I think that's very difficult. There's absolutely nothing in the, uh, in the, um, uh, uh, in the literature about that at all. Uh, so, uh, and then full anticoagulation, as I've already mentioned, Carrier uh, established this, is probably safe when the platelets are greater than 50 uh, times 10 to 9 per litre. Um, one has to consider the causes of thrombocytopenia associated with uh, a, a cancer. And obviously, uh, a chemotherapy effect is probably number one. The effect of cancer on the bone marrow, maybe number two. ITP, DIC, uh, and, the, and then the rare of causes, uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura and HIT. Um, and of course, one has to... Uh, uh, think carefully about the increased risks of bleeding, certainly in those of advanced age and frailty, those, those with renal failure because they already have a, a, um, an increased risk for uh, bleeding in association with the renal failure uh, and abnormal clotting of all sorts, but I would suggest that uh, vitamin K deficiency is one of the most uh, important. So um, what the BCSH guidance from 2015 suggests, uh, and this is their... Uh, uh, cancer and thrombosis guideline, uh, recently published, um, support the platelet count uh, uh, greater than 50, so they've adopted that, to allow full dose anticoagulation to continue uh, through highest risk period for, for recurrence, and they have agreed that that uh, ought to be three months. That a temporary IVC filter should only be considered if thrombocytopenia is persistent and it's difficult to overcome, or other bleeding is present. If the platelet count cannot be increased, then consider giving 50% dose of low molecular heparin uh, with the, when the platelets are between 25 and, uh, uh, and 50, uh, and frequent assessment. C can I, uh, and uh, if below 25 times 10 per litre, withhold anticoagulation. Uh, there's some evidence from really quite a long time ago that prophylactic low, molecular, low molecular weight evidence that prophylactic low molecular heparin may be beneficial particularly, or more beneficial particularly, uh, in thrombocytopenia individuals. Can I bring to your attention here quickly that uh, this evidence base is not very good. It's 2D evidence base, which is really quite a low uh, evidence base, but it's the best we have at the moment, mainly because there aren't studies to, to uh, um, um, help support that. Um, and this is a, a, a schemata which is uh, produced by um, Agnes Lee from 2013, which essentially says much the same. If the platelet count is greater than, greater than 50, full uh, weight-based dose of low molecular heparin. If it's less than, uh, you transfuse to get the platelet count up above 50, you then give full dose. If, you, if, it's, uh, if, if you're unable to get it above 50, uh, but able to get it between 20 and 50, give half dose. Less than 20, actually they say 20 rather than 25, whole anticoagulation. Uh, and essentially, it, uh, that's for acute v VTE events, and essentially it's exactly the same for subacute or chronic VTE events. I'm going to move on quickly now to the, uh, the risk of bleeding associated with anticoagulation in patients with uh, 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 cancer-associated thrombosis. Um, there's an increased risk for bleeding in patients. We've heard that uh, more than once uh, already in patients with CAT and uh, receiving uh, vitamin K antagonists in particular, uh, uh, as far as Prandoni's paper in 2002. Uh, about a third, particularly in the initial stage of anticoagulation in uh, his cohort of patients. The bleeding risk, as we've mentioned, is in, in cancer patients is dependent on many, many factors, and we don't need to go into those again, but there are many of them. Uh, there's no correlation between the bleeding risk for, uh, sorry, between the risk for bleeding and the INR level, apparently, in patients with cancer, uh, according to Pallaretti. Uh, that was a while ago, but uh, I think that it needs to be born in, taken into consideration. Uh, and there are similar bleeding rates, rates associated with low molecular heparin and VKAs, uh, vitamin K antagonists, according to Hull from uh, uh, about 11 years ago. So uh, how does one manage bleeding in association with uh, um, cancer-associated thrombosis, uh, anticoagulation in those patients? You must do this on an individual patient basis. Individuals have to be assessed for bleeding versus recurrent thrombotic risks before even considering anticoagulation. When they have minor bleeding, then it's sensible to continue full-dose anticoagulation, with, obviously with careful follow-up. Um, 
In patients with moderate to serious bleeding or absolute contraindications to anticoagulation, withhold and consider an IVC filter. Uh, and platelet uh, transfusions may allow anticoagulation, as I've already mentioned. Uh, and uh, so, once again, uh, that information was taken from the uh, BCSH guidance uh, from 2015. And then there is a... Um, here we go, sorry. Um, and then I want to move on to recurrent thrombosis as my last topic. So, cancer confers a fourfold increased risk for recurrent VTE as opposed to those who don't have cancer. This occurs both during and after anticoagulation, believe it or not, uh, and we've already mentioned the three to six-fold increased risk of major bleeding in association with cancer patients anticoagulated. Uh, one has to assess uh, uh, compliance with the anticoagulation regimen, and we also have to assess for mechanical uh, compression of large veins, particularly lar in large tumour masses. You should be considering other causes of a low uh, of uh, recurrent VTE, such as heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Uh, and the registries show a very, very heterogeneous approach to recurrent VTE in patients with cancer. Um, there are several guidelines I've, I've been to, so let's just quick look at the, the ASCO guidelines. Uh, they say use an anticoagulant from a different class or use higher doses of low molecular heparin um, uh, than you're using at the moment. Locally, we tend, we tend to use 1.5 milligram for an, an oxaparin, 1.5 milligrams per kilogram daily. We tend to increase that to a BD dose, I have to say, of one milligram per kilogram. Um, or consider the use of an IVC filter, but there's no, absolutely no evidence for its use in cancer-associated thrombosis. It's being developed, but, but, but not at the moment. And the European uh, oncology guidelines have, uh, have suggested bridging with low molecular heparin if you were already on a VKA, but with a low INR, to get the INR up into the uh, um, established uh, uh, therapeutic range. To increase INR treatment range if you're already on a, 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 a a VKA with a, um, a therapeutic INR to three to four. Um, tr transition to a treatment dose of low molecular heparin if already using a, a, a prophylactic dose, I mean, very sensible suggestions and understandable, or, or treat with full dose escalation, which I've already mentioned uh, to you before. Um, this is Korana from his guidance from last year. He suggests giving a therapeutic anticoagulation with an agent other than low molecular heparin. Uh, uh, sorry, when you are giving a, uh, um, an agent other than low molecular heparin, uh, think about giving um, uh, low molecular heparin. That optimal anticoagulation with low molecular heparin, uh, then the, when there is optimal anticoagulation, anticoagulation with a low molecular heparin, continue that at a higher dose, as I've already mentioned, but, uh, and started an increased dose of about 25%, is what uh, he, he suggests. That non-therapeutic dose at the time of recurrence, uh, then you need to switch to a therapeutic dose of low molecular heparin. But he doesn't believe in the use of IVC filters, except in the presence of absolute contraindications to anticoagulation, e.g. active bleeding. And if so, then uh, we should be using retrievable filters. Um, and this is a, schema, a schemata uh, identifying that again from Agnes Lee, who essentially says ex exactly the same. Uh, so for sub-therapeutic anticoagulation, if it's, if it's a vitamin K antagonist, uh, bridge with low molecular heparin until the INR target range is, 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 is reached. If it's low molecular heparin, switch to a full dose, if it was a, um, a, a, a low dose low molecular heparin. Um, if, if, if it's a VKA here, then shift to full dose of low molecular heparin. If it's a low molecular heparin, increase by 25%. Uh, reassess in a week, if no improvement. G do peak anti-10A levels and adjust the doses to keep towards the higher end of the target range. Uh, and if you get symptomatic improvement, obviously continue uh, with that dose. Uh, and, and then he talks about uh, increasing the doses of low molecular heparin down below. Uh, sorry. She does, that's Agnes Lee. Okay. So, in summary, cancer 
as we've heard on several occasions, increases the risk for VTE, about fourfold. Those with cancer and VTE have a worse prognosis. CT scanning for patients with unprovoked VTE identifies cancer, now I think it's reasonable to say, in about 4% of people. We are still waiting for that last meta-analysis to be published. Current advice is that routine screening and clinical history generally are sufficient to rule out cancer. Bleeding is generally higher in the anticoagulated cancer patients and that thrombocytopenia is relatively common and needs monitoring in those anticoagulated uh, uh, for cat, uh, for yeah, cat, with platelet support if necessary. Bleeding is increased in cancer patients, and, 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 which I've already mentioned, that needs very careful assessment uh, uh, of the patient, and an IVC filter fitted uh, if anticoagulation is essential. I, uh, I'm not... Yeah, there, there's some debate about that because, the, because the, uh, 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 there isn't a great deal of evidence to support it. And finally, recurrent VTE requires, generally speaking, increased anticoagulation wherever possible. Thank you.